Poor Hananiah. It's so easy to condemn him and so difficult to understand and even empathize with him. The prophet Jeremiah is one of my favorite figures in the Bible. You might have guessed that from last week's sermon. So I'm naturally inclined to take Jeremiah's side in this dispute between prophets. Hananiah is a flunky of the king, a liar, a false prophet who was not sent by God. Then I read an essay on him by Charles L. Aaron Jr., who pointed out, Hey, preachers, have you ever softened your words to please a congregation? Have you ever held back what you believed was the truth to avoid someone's anger? I had to be honest and admit, yeah, I've done those things. Aaron went on, then you can't judge Hananiah so quickly. I was taken aback by that. Maybe I've got Hananiah wrong. He had a difficult job in an impossible situation. And maybe his story can be God's word to us as we face our own challenging situations. The time is about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. Israel had once been a strong, united kingdom under David, its greatest ruler. But that was centuries ago. David's kingdom has split into two, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel has been conquered by the Assyrian Empire, which was itself swallowed up by the Babylonian Empire soon after. Judah still holds on as an independent kingdom. But Babylon is engaged in a slow-motion conquest. Babylon is huge and wealthy compared to Judah, with a much bigger, stronger army. The Babylonians have already seized the treasures from Judah's temple in Jerusalem. Judah's king, Jeconiah, his immediate family, and many of Judah's leaders have surrendered to Babylon and gone into voluntary exile. Jeconiah's uncle, Zedekiah, is now king of Judah. He has a couple of options. He can accept Babylonian domination and become a vassal state, or he can resist and fight for Judah's independence. Zedekiah does what kings of Israel and Judah do when they face life or death decisions for their kingdom. They consult prophets to hear the word of God. Jeremiah is a prophet called by God, but not an official court prophet. He has a reputation in Jerusalem as a pain in the neck, gloomy, pessimistic, always going on about violence and destruction. He's known for symbolic acts. Jeremiah has made a wooden yoke, the kind of thing you put on your oxen to pull a plow, and he's been wearing this yoke around Jerusalem. He says this yoke represents the yoke of Babylon. And Jeremiah says, God says that any nation that accepts Babylon's yoke will stay in its own land. But any nation that throws off the yoke of Babylon will be destroyed and its people exiled. Jeremiah says this to Judah's allies, then to King Zedekiah, then to the priests and people. We can picture them all gathered in the temple, the house of God, listening to Jeremiah. He has some freedom to speak. He's an outsider. He knows no one at court is going to listen to him, so he might as well let them have it. The priests and people listen to gloomy old Jeremiah, then they turn to Hananiah. Hananiah is an official court prophet, called by God and also by the king. Hananiah's ability to speak God's word to the king depends on his relationship with Zedekiah. The court prophet has the king's ear, but say too many things the king doesn't want to hear, and a court prophet is out of a job. Hananiah says he hears a different word from God, that God will break the yoke of Babylon. Two more years, and all the treasures of the temple will return, with King Jeconiah and all the exiles. Jeremiah, who's still wearing the wooden yoke, is never one to pass up an opportunity to argue. He says, Amen. May it be so. May God bring the temple treasures and the exiles back home. We don't have a sense of the tone he uses here, whether he is sarcastic or sincere. Maybe Jeremiah would love for Hananiah's words to be fulfilled. But Jeremiah doesn't see that happening. He points out that many prophets before them have foreseen war, famine, and pestilence. He doesn't need to add, 
and they were right. If a prophecy of peace comes true, only then will Judah know that God has truly sent that prophet. Hananiah responds by lifting the yoke off Jeremiah's neck and smashing it. He reiterates his words, two more years and God will break the yoke of Babylon just like this. Jeremiah senses this is as far as he's going to get today, so he leaves the temple. Let's pause here for a moment. At this point in the story, how do we know which prophet speaks the truth? Which is the faithful response to the threat from Babylon? Acceptance or resistance? We don't know. Both acceptance and resistance can be faithful responses. As Jeremiah points out, the outcome will tell you which was the right choice. We know that Jeremiah was the true prophet and Hananiah the false one only because we know how the story unfolds. The temple treasures and the exiles did not come home in two years. King Zedekiah stopped paying tribute to Babylon. He chose to resist. Babylon retaliated by attacking Judah. The Babylonians captured and burned Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took Zedekiah and the rest of Judah's leadership into exile. Judah ended up wearing the iron yoke of Babylon. As I have sat with Hananiah this week, the word from God I have heard is about decision-making, how you discern a path forward when both options may be faithful choices. The words I've heard are humility, charity, and prayer. We may be wrong. We may prophesy peace, but we won't know that we speak the truth until there is peace. So we are humble as we discern. Because we may be wrong, we approach disagreements with charity. Much as I love Jeremiah, he is not the model for this. We acknowledge that those with whom we disagree may be right. They too are trying to be faithful. And our generosity of heart lets us love one another when we are not of one mind and we pray. We do our research, we use the minds God has given us, and we take our multiple faithful options to prayer. We ask others to pray for us as we decide. And then, with fear and trembling, we make our decision. We are wrapping up the survey about worship at St. John's moving forward as the pandemic rolls on. I know you have been waiting to hear about this, the survey has taken much longer than we expected. The results so far indicate that we are not of one mind about returning to in-person worship. I would be shocked if we were. About half the respondents have said they will not return to in-person worship until there is a vaccine for COVID-19. They personally are at high risk, or they need to be in close contact with someone at high risk, or church with young children is not feasible until we're able to resume children's church. Other respondents, a smaller number, are ready to return to in-person worship right now. Both options, continuing exclusively online or resuming in person with services online for those who can't attend, both of these options can be faithful choices. Both options have risks. Some of our friends in Christ and other churches have chosen one path, some the other. At St. John's, the wardens, music director, chair of the worship committee, and I will make our decision in the next couple of days. Look for a communication from me this week. Jeremiah might have been wrong. Hananiah might have been right. Only the outcome shows which one was the true prophet. And if I'm being honest, we might be wrong too. The worship decision-making team has read the guidelines from our diocese and from public health experts. We are listening to your input. We are praying about this. We are striving to make the right decision for St. John's. And it's possible that we might turn out like Hananiah. Some of you will agree with our decision about worship, and some of you won't. Wherever we find ourselves, we treat each other with charity and a generosity of heart that lets us love one another despite our disagreements because this is the work God has given us to do, to love God and love our neighbors, 
to reshape this hurting world into a place of justice and equality. And we approach that work the same way we make decisions, with humility, charity, and prayer.